Hi, welcome back to Educator.com. Today we're going to talk about systems of linear inequalities. In the previous lesson we worked with systems of linear equations. In this lesson we'll work with systems of linear inequalities. Remember, equations are based on equal sign. Left side equals right side. But inequalities are relationships based on less than. I should perhaps use something different. So less than, less than or equal, greater than or equal, or greater than. Since we haven't really worked with inequalities before in this course, we'll first, have, we'll first have a brief refresher. After that, we'll consider systems of linear inequalities and how their solutions are based on all of the inequalities at the same time. Finally, we'll see how systems of linear inequalities can be applied through linear programming, which will allow us to solve optimization problems. Let's go! When solving a linear equation in one variable, we always find exactly one solution. For example, if we have x plus 1 equals 0, we subtract by 1 on both sides, and we get x equals negative 1. So on the number line, we'd see that the answer to this is when x is negative 1 on the number line. On the other hand, when we solve a linear inequality in one variable, we find an infinite variety of solutions. So if we had x plus 1 is greater than or equal to 0, we subtract by 1 on both sides, we get x is greater than or equal to negative 1, which means we've got x at greater, x equal to negative 1 of this one of the solutions, but we also are allowed to go anywhere above that, right? Positive 3 would be an answer to this, positive 52 would be an answer to this, negative 1 half would be an answer to this. Everything from negative 1 on up is an answer to this. It, every Everything there will satisfy our inequality. This idea of a wide variety of answers will be important to us as we work with systems of linear inequalities, so we want to keep this in mind. For the most part, when you're doing algebra with an inequality, it's just the same as doing it with an equation. We can do any arithmetic operation, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, on both sides just like normal algebra. However, there is one special thing to be aware of. If you use algebra to multiply or divide by a negative number, the relationship flips. So for example, if we have negative x plus 1, we can subtract by 1 on both sides, and we get negative x is less than negative 1. At this point, we want to make our x positive, so we multiply both sides by negative 1, and that causes our sign to flip. We, sorry, not our sign, but our inequality symbol to flip to the other way. So we go from less than to greater than now. So we now have x is greater than 1. So this is really important to remember. You don't want to forget about this when you're working with inequalities. Anytime you multiply or divide by a negative number, it will cause your less than, greater than, less than or equal to, greater than or equal to, whatever you're dealing with, it will flip. Your inequality symbol will flip to the other direction. It's really easy to miss this flip. It's a really easy mistake to make. So just be careful with this. Every time you're doing either multiplication or division and it's a negative number that you're dealing with, negative anything that you're multiplying on both sides, you want to make sure you remember about this flipping thing. Notice that we can also get the same thing as we have here if we just added x to both sides. If we'd had plus x and plus x, we would have had 1 is less than x, which is equivalent to saying x is greater than 1. They're just the same statement, two different ways of saying it. What causes this to happen? Why do we see this negative flipping? You've probably learned about it in algebra for a very long time, but you might not have a great understanding of it. So let's actually get this. Consider if we had some a and b where a is less than b. So on our number line, a would come before b. a would be closer to the zero than b would be. So what would it look like if we multiplied a and b by negative 1? Well, that would cause this mirroring around the zero, right? They would pop to the side opposite depending on the distance that they originally were from the zero. So negative b and negative a appear here, but notice that negative b is now farther to the left than negative a. Just as b was farther to the right, it's now going to be farther to the left. So there's still a relationship, but now the relationship has flipped. Because b was more positive than a, b was originally more right than a, we know that negative b has to be more negative, has to be more left than negative a. Thus, we've got this negative a is greater than negative b. Because originally a is less than b, but now negative b is less than negative a, so that causes our sign to effectively flip, because negative b is less than negative a is the same thing as saying negative a is greater than negative b. Great, that's what's going on. You want to stick to basic operations. When you're working with inequalities, you want to try to keep using addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. You can use more complicated algebra like raising both sides to a power, or taking a square root, or taking a logarithm, or taking some trigonometric function, but they can cause little problems to crop up. Consider if you have x squared greater than zero. 
Now, that does not imply that x is greater than 0. We might think x squared greater than 0. So I'll take the square root of both sides. So square root of x squared is greater than plus or minus 0. Well, that's just 0. So we've got x is greater than 0, right? No, that's not true at all. Over here, x equals negative 3 is true. It checks out. Negative 3 squared is greater than 0 because 9 is greater than 0. So that's great. But negative 3 is greater than 0? That's completely false. That is not a true statement. So we do not have this ability to just toss out other more complicated algebra things without really thinking about all the implications that are going to happen here. So this idea here doesn't work because we're dealing with an inequality. We can't just take square roots like we can when we're dealing with equations, which is how we built up all that previous theory. So when you have an inequality and you want to do a more something more than just a basic operation on both sides, you really have to be careful and think about what you're doing. That means that it's best to stick to basic arithmetic. So we really just want to stick with addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. Not because it's impossible to do this other stuff, not because you wouldn't get it, but just because it's easy to make a mistake doing it. You can wind up making mistakes because you haven't thought about absolutely all of the ramifications, so you want to stick to the basic operations because it's easy to see what happens. And remember, even with the basic operations, when we have multiplication and division, there's still a little bit of danger there because when you do, do it with a negative number, it causes flipping of your inequality. So with all this in mind, you really it's just best to stick to basic arithmetic. Happily, since we're only going to be working with linear inequalities, that means we can get through everything just using these basic operations. Addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, they're going to be enough to manipulate our linear inequalities into forms that make it easier for us to understand. All right. So that finishes up our refresher. Now we're ready to actually talk about linear inequalities in two variables. So a linear inequality in two or more variables tells us about a relationship between those variables. Consider negative x plus y is greater than or equal to 1. So we can make it easier to interpret by just having y on one side and other stuff involving x on the other. So we add x to both sides, plus x, plus x, and we get y is greater than or equal to x plus 1. This gives us a relationship between x and y, how they're connected. If x is equal to 1, we know that y has to be greater than or equal to 2, right? If x is 1, then y has to be greater than or equal to 1 plus 1, so y must be greater than or equal to 2. Similarly, if x were equal to negative 9, then that would mean that y is greater than or equal to negative 8. So depending on what the x is, we'll change the requirements on our y. So it's a relationship. It's not this definite single static defined thing. It's this relationship of as x shifts, y has to shift in certain ways to accommodate the shifting x. Now, notice, unlike a linear, in a linear equality, where a single x would give us just a single y, a single x in an inequality gives infinitely many possible y's, right? x equals 1 means y is greater than or equal to 2. So x equals 1 means that y equals 2 is good, y equals 5 is good, y equals 47 is good, y equals a billion is good. We've got this stack of possibilities, as long as they follow that inequality relationship. If x equals 1, y still can't be equal to negative 3. So it's not anything goes, it just has to follow this inequality relationship. But if it does, there's an infinite variety of things it could wind up being. The best way to understand inequalities is by graphing them. This gives us a visual reference to see all the possible solutions. So for example, if we had y greater than or equal to x plus 1, we could graph it like this. Because it's a greater than or equal to, everything on our actual line, right? Everything on the line is allowed as a solution because y equals x plus 1 is going to be true by greater than or equal. That or equal means we can have equality. The line itself will be true. But then in addition to that, everything above the line is also going to be true. Everything in here is going to wind up being true. And you should notice that it doesn't just stop at the edge there. Once again, it's like how we don't draw arrows to show that it keeps going. We've gotten used to assuming that the graph keeps going beyond the edges of our graphing window. We're going to also be assuming that our shading goes past the edges. It doesn't stop suddenly. It goes forever infinitely up. So Everything above the line is a solution because if y is greater than or equal to x plus 1, then consider at x is 0, then 1 is true for y, but so would 2 be true for y. Let's use a different color just so we can see this a little bit easier. 2 would be true for y, 3 would be true for y, 4 would be true for y, 5 would be true for y, 6 would be true for y, and anything above that. So as long as we're above this line with our y value, 
for a given x value will wind up being true. The y is greater than or equal to x plus 1 is true. So a graph is a really, really great way to get across all of these possibilities because it's not just this single line. It's certainly not just a single point. It's this huge variety. It's this large area of possibilities. This brings up a question. What does the line become if the inequality is strict, less than or greater than, as opposed to not strict, which is less than or equal to or greater than or equal to? So if we've got a strict inequality, less than or greater than, it is purely less than or it is purely greater than. We show this by changing how we draw the line in the graph. So if it's a strict graph, like y is greater than x plus 1, we show that it's strict by using a dashed line. It's a little bit hard to see here, but notice that the line is actually dashed like this. So that says that what we're saying, we're saying that we're not including the line, we're only including the stuff above the line, but the line itself is not allowed. On the flip side, if it is a not strict inequality, like greater than or equal to, we show it by using a solid line saying that the line itself is actually going to be an answer as well. If you're on the line, that's an allowed answer in addition to all the stuff that is above it. So, we show the points on the line are not solutions, not solutions to our inequality. So we show that with a dashed line, when it is a strict inequality, we show that they are solutions with a solid line when it is a not strict inequality. And then we just shade the appropriate side. So in both of these cases, we had greater than and greater than or equal to, so they both had the part that was above it. Now, we don't necessarily have a very great way to see how to shade which way. You get a sense of which, if it's up or if it's down as you work with these more. You can pay attention to what the y is and is it less than or greater than. But a really great, great way to be sure of which side to uh, shade is by using a test point. So you can shade by seeing how does this test point get affected. Would this test point satisfy our inequality or would it fail to satisfy it? So if the point satisfies the inequality. You just choose some point. It's completely your choice. You choose some point, and if it satisfies the inequality, then the whole side does, because we have to shade in an entire side. So if one point on one side satisfies, that entire side has to satisfy. On the flip, if the other side, sorry, if it doesn't, if the point does not satisfy the inequality, then the other side will satisfy the inequality. So if your point fails to satisfy, the opposite side will satisfy it. This makes it easy for us to shade. So for example, if we have y is less than negative 5 halves x plus 3, we can try shade, try the test point 0, comma zero. Zero comma zero is almost always a great test point because you can plug in zeros really, really easily, right? So let's see, would that wind up working out? If we have y less than negative five halves x plus three, we plug in zero for our y, we plug in zero for our x plus three. So we've got is zero less than three. Sure enough, that checks out. So our test point is good. If our test point is good, that means the entire side must be good. So we just shade this side to say anything below that line is going to be true. And notice, how did we get this line in the first place? We just take our inequality, we turn it into a line as if it had been equation, y equals negative 5 halves x plus 3. And then we graph that because we know that's going to be our line of demarcation. It's going to be the place where the shading changes over. And then it gets dash because it is a strict inequality. So that's why we've got that dash line. And then we shade off of that line that we drew. Alternatively, we could have tested a different point, like let's say 4 comma 4. Maybe we had wanted to test 4 comma 4. Well, if we tested that 4 for our y less than negative 5 halves times 4 plus 3. So 4 is less than negative 5 halves times 4. So that gets us uh, negative 10 plus 3. So is 4 less than negative 7? No, that fails to be true. So this side cannot be the side that gets shaded in. That side is not going to wind up being true. But really, I recommend using the point 0, 0. You could use any point. You could use 1, 0, negative 5, 3, whatever point is useful for your specific case. But 0, 0 is almost always going to be something. You want to choose something that's definitely on one side or the other. You don't want to choose something on the line itself. But 0, 0, as long as it's not on one of your lines, 
that's going to be a really good test point for using. All right. So if you're graphing a system of inequalities, you do it in the same way. You graph each of the lines as if they were, in, as if they were equalities, and you use either a dashed line if it is a strict inequality, less than or greater, and you use a solid line if it is a not strict inequality, less than or equal or greater than or equal, and then you shade in each inequality appropriately. And the shadings overlap. Wherever the shadings overlap is the set of solutions to the system. So let's see how that would work out here. So for this one, y less than 2 thirds x minus 2, that is our red dashed line, dashed because it is a less than. So let's try the test point 0 comma 0 for that. So 0 comma 0. So we plug that in. We've got 0 is less than 2 thirds times 0 minus 2. So 0 is less than negative 2. Not true, right? 0 is greater than negative 2. So this fails. So that means the side opposite our test point is going to have to be what we shade in for the red one. So our test point was in the very center in the origin. So we're going to be opposite that side. So this is going to be what we shade in for the red line. Y less than 2 thirds x minus 2 is true for everything in the shaded, but not on the dashed line itself. Then if we have y greater than or equal to negative 2x plus 1, let's use that same test point. It's not on that line either. So 0 comma 0, 0 is greater than or equal to negative 2 times 0 plus 1. So 0 is greater than or equal to 1. Is that true? No, 0 is not greater than or equal to 1. So that fails here as well. 0 is not greater than 1. So that fails. So by the same logic, we're going to have to be opposite that side, greater than or equal. So we're going to be above it. So we shade in the side that is opposite. Also, you can think of this as being y is greater, so it must be above the line. And the red one was y is less than, so it must be below it. But the test points are a nice way to be absolutely sure of it. And notice how we've got overlapping. We've got red and blue overlapping in this bottom right portion. So that means the part that really truly makes up the answers is everything in here, right? And that's going to keep going out forever as long as it's in there. So everything on the blue line actually would be an answer, but things on the red dashed line, so the blue dashed line, sorry, the blue solid line here, that is going to be answers. But the red dashed line here, since it's dashed, that fails to be answers because it doesn't uh, satisfy our inequality y less than 2 thirds x minus 2 because that's strict. So every it's on the blue line in that shaded portion, it's an answer. If it's on the dashed red line, it's not an answer. And there we are. We can see how the function comes together. Sorry, not how the function comes together. We can see how the system comes together. We can see all of the solutions to it at once. All right, now solutions are best found through graphing. Graphing is usually the best way to understand the solutions to a system of linear inequalities, as long as it's in two dimensions. If we're dealing with really high numbers of dimensions, it gets kind of hard to graph. But if we're in two dimensions, it's a good way to understand what's going on. It gives us a way to visually comprehend what we're seeing. It lets us see all the requirements that the system places on the variables, right? So this system of uh, inequalities, it makes certain requirements of our variables. And by graphing it, we're able to see all of the requirements at the same time. Now, with a linear equality, if we had a linear equality, equal sign for left and right side between the two, we could use substitution or elimination because we were solving for a single answer. So a linear equality, it's solving for one answer. But with a system of inequalities, with a system of inequalities, we aren't going to get just one answer. We're going to have infinitely many answers, right? Because our shadings, we've got shadings. So as long as we've got overlapping shadings for our system, that entire area of overlap where all of our uh, inequalities overlap together, that's going to be all of our answers. And because it's an area, there's infinitely many things inside of that area. Now, it is possible for us to have no answers whatsoever if the shadings don't overlap, right? If one side shades up and the other side shades down and they never touch each other, 
Now, it's never going to have any answers because the two can never agree. They are inconsistent. But as long as they wind up agreeing in some portion, some amount of area, inside of that area, we will have infinitely many answers. So when working with a system of inequalities, you'll almost always want to graph because you can graph it and then shade in the solutions and you're able to see what's going on and get an intuitive visual sense of how this thing is coming together. All right. Now we're able to talk about linear programming. An excellent application of linear inequalities is linear programming. Uh, it's not like not quite like computer programming, but it helps us optimize. It's actually quite a bit different than computer programming, but in any case, it helps us optimize systems and make the best choice given certain requirements. So what does it mean to optimize? Well, we start with a linear objective function. So we've got something that is our objective, something that is sort of looking at the variables that we're dealing with. And we're trying to either maximize the objective function or we're trying to minimize the objective function. So we might want to try to maximize something like profit, right? Or we might want to try to minimize something like cost, right? These are useful things for it. Business is something where linear programming will definitely pop up. For example, we could have an objective function like z equals 2x plus 7y. So if we've got z equals 2x plus 7y, it uses x, it uses y, it's an objective function. We get some number out of 2x plus 7y. So we want to try to maximize or minimize this quantity z. Now notice, if there's no restrictions on z, I mean, sorry, there's no restrictions on x and y, z will be at its biggest when x is flying out to infinity and y is flying out to infinity. It will be minimized when x is flying to negative infinity and y is flying to negative infinity. So we need to have some limitations on what x and y are going to be for us to actually be able to find any maximum or minimum for that to be meaningful. And indeed, when you're working with linear programming, the variables in the objective function, these variables x and y, they're going to have various constraints on them, things that keep them from being able to go anywhere. And those constraints will be given as a system of linear inequalities. So we might have constraints like x plus 3y must be less than or equal to 8, 2x plus y must be less than or equal to negative 4, and negative x plus 2y must be greater than or equal to negative 3. So our objective will be to find the maximum or minimum of our objective function. Remember our objective function in this case was our z equals 2x plus 7y while we're obeying these constraints. We can't break these constraints. So we have to stick within, within these constraints, but we're trying to get z to be the biggest or the smallest thing we possibly can get out of it. So once we know what our objective function is, z in the previous slide, the first step is to graph the system of linear inequalities. To do that, we probably want to put them in a form that we can easily graph, right? So x plus 3y less than or equal to 8, we can convert that into y is less than or equal to negative 1 third x plus 8 thirds, right? We subtract by x and then divide by 3. Uh, we can convert 2x plus y is less than or equal to negative 4 into negative 2x minus 4 by subtracting by 2x. And negative x plus 2y is greater than or equal to negative 3. We add x to both sides and then divide by 2. So we've got things that are easy for us to graph, right? We've got slope, we've got y-intercept at this point, so we can graph these. We graph these and we get this. And we also shade in, and according to our shading, we find out that what's inside of there is going to be what is allowed by these constraints. So the shaded area is the location of all feasible solutions. And by feasible, we mean those that are allowed by the constraints, those that are possible things that we can even begin to consider using. So the location of our optimum value, whether it's a maximum or a minimum, must be inside of this portion, right? It has to be inside of the shaded thing or on the lines because these were all less than or equal or greater than or equal. They're all not strict, so we can be on the lines as well. So since we can be on the lines, it has to be somewhere either on the lines or inside of that shaded portion. We know that for sure, right? Otherwise, it won't have followed the constraint, so we can't even look at it for trying to use our objective function. Here's the critical idea. The theory of linear programming tells us that if the solution exists, if there is some optimum max or minimum, if we can maximize or minimize our objective function, if that exists, then it occurs at a vertex of the set of feasible solutions. Now, a vertex of the set is one of the corners of the set, right? So where two or more 
of them intersect, that is going to be one of the vertices. A vertex occurs at a corner. Now we can find the locations of the vertices by solving for intersection points, right? We can see where does the red line intersect the blue line? Where does the green line intersect the blue line? Where does the green line intersect the red line? We're just using what we learned from systems of linear equations to be able to figure out where do two lines intersect each other. So we can figure out where these vertices are located. Once we know all the vertices, we just try each of them in our objective function, right? We can figure out each of these vertices from what we learned in the previous lesson. We can understand what's going on from what we've seen in this lesson. And then from there, we just plug them into our objective function. And whichever winds up coming out to be highest or lowest winds up being our maximum or a minimum. We'll see this process done in example three and in example four. All right. Ready for some examples. So first one, give the system of linear inequalities that produces the below graph. So first thing, let's figure out what are the lines that we're seeing drawn here. Before we even worry about dashed and, you know, is it greater than, is it less than, is it less than or equal, is it greater than or equal, before we even worry about that, let's just figure out what equation could draw each of these lines. So for our red one right here, we see that it's a horizontal line. It's at y height of negative 2. So that would be made up by y equals negative 2, right? That equation would draw that line. Of course, it's not going to be a less than or equal less than or equal or a greater than or equal because it was dashed, but we know that that line would be drawn by y equals negative 2. We'll come back to figuring out what it is later. Our green one is going to be, it's set at a horizontal location of 4. It has no slope whatsoever. It's vertical. So that's going to be x equals 4, right? We've set our horizontal location at 4 and our y is allowed to freely roam up and down. Finally, the only one that might even be slightly difficult is this blue dashed line which goes from uh, 0, 4 to 2, 0. So if that's the case, we can figure out what's the slope of our blue one. It manages to go down 4. It has a vertical change of negative 4 over a horizontal change of positive 2, right? It goes from a height of 4 to a height of 0 by going two steps to the right. So that means it's got a slope of negative 2. We also see that its y-intercept is right here at 4. So its y-intercept is 4. So we've got y equals negative 2x plus 4. So at this point, we've got equations that would produce each of these lines. So now it's a question of what symbol goes in there. We can't use equals because that would be an actual line. We need inequalities. So now it's a question of less than, greater than, less than or equal to, or greater than or equal for each of these. Right? We're going to swap out that equal sign for something that can actually be used as an inequality. So first step, the red. The red has to shade above because we've got stuff above it. Because if we go below it, right, below it, that fails to be true, so it must be above it. That means y has to be greater than, strictly greater than, because it is a dashed line, right? Strictly greater than, y has to be greater than negative 2. If we want to be absolutely sure about this, we can try the test point 0, comma 0. If we plug in 0 is greater than negative 2, hey, that works out, so we know that side is correct. That is the side that we want. For the green one, we see that it's on the left side of that. So if it's on the left side, we know that x the horizontal values that we're allowed to use must be less than 4. Is it less than or less than or equal to? It's less than or equal to because it is a solid line. So less than or equal to 4. We can also check out a test point. If we plug in 0, 0, then we've got 0 is less than or equal to 4. Yep, that's true. So we know that that's correct for that shading. And then finally, our blue one. For this one, we know that it's shading up, right? So if it's shading up, then it must be our y values are greater than, and it's going to be strictly greater because it was a dashed blue line. y is greater than negative 2x plus 4. If we want to check that with a test point, we can try a test point just like we did the others. This one is a little bit harder to do in our head since it involves more things. So 0 is greater than negative 2 times 0 plus 4. 0 is greater than 4. That test point fails, so indeed it has to be shaded on this side. So we chose the correct, sorry, didn't mean to make that look like a greater than or equal to. We chose the correct symbol. y is greater than negative 2x plus 4. So in total, these are the inequalities that make that system be graphed like that. Great. 
Second example, graph the solutions to the system below. So first thing we want to do, we probably want to convert this into a form where we can easily graph these. So y divide by negative 3. So since we're dividing by a negative number, the sign flips. We've got y is less than or equal to negative 2. Next up, 3x plus y is less than 3, so y is less than subtracting by negative, sorry, subtracting by 3x, negative 3x plus 3. Don't have to worry about flipping because it's addition or subtraction. And then finally, 6x minus 4y, so negative 4y is less than negative 6x minus 4 divided by negative 4y. It flips because we divided by a negative number, so negative 6 divided by negative 4 becomes positive 3 halves x, negative 4 divided by negative 4 becomes positive 1. So at this point, we've got enough for us to graph this thing, so let's draw some axes in. Do, 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 do. Make a tick mark spacing is just a length of one. So one, two, three, four, five. 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 Great. So at this point, we can draw each one of these in. We'll draw them in as lines first, and then from there we'll figure out how to shade. So y is less than or equal to negative 2. We use a solid line because it is less than or equal, so it's not strict. So at height negative 2, we are going to have a line because we said y is less than or equal to negative 2, so we graph in the line as if it was y equals negative 2. So we've just set a vertical height of negative 2, and our x is allowed to freely roam. Next up, the red one, y is less than negative 3x plus 3. So our first point is at the y-intercept of 3. If we go over one step, we will have our slope of negative 3 kick in. We'll go down 3. So we can draw this one in. All right. Whoops. Should have had that be dashed because it was a less than. So it is strict. So I'll dash that with the eraser. And then finally, our green one, won't forget to dash this one, 3 halves x plus 1. So we have a y-intercept at 1. If we go over 2, we go up 3 because our slope is 3 halves. So over 2, up 3, 1, 2, 3. We draw this one in. All right, and now let's figure out our shading. So y is less than or equal to negative 2. Well, if it's less than or equal to negative 2, we have to have shading below that. So we shade below that here. Because we can use a test point like 0, 0, but we also see that y has to be below negative 2. Otherwise, that's going to not be true. So we shade in below that. For our red one, y has to be less than negative 3x plus 3. Once again, the y's will have to be below this value. We can use a test point like 0, 0. If we plug that in, we'll have 0 is less than negative 3 times 0 plus 3, which means 0 is less than positive 3, which is indeed true. So we shade towards that test point of 0, 0. And then finally, we've got a green one. Y is greater than 3 halves, uh, 3 halves plus x. So 3 halves plus x is going to get us this one here. So that's going to cause us to shade up. Right, if we plug in test point of 0, comma 0, we've got 0 is greater than 3 halves times 0 means 0 is greater than 1. Whoops. If 0 is greater than 1, oh yeah, that would fail to be true. So we are shading the opposite way. We're shading away from our original test point. So our original test point was 0, 0. So we're shading in the opposite direction of that. So let's extend our red so we can see a little bit better where we're going. So at this point, we see the only place that winds up having green, red, and blue together is this section over here. So here, I'm shading in with a zigzag purple. This section over here and continuing out in that arc will wind up being the answers to our solution. We see the solution graphed in that way. All right. 
Third example, find the maximum and minimum values of the objective function z equals 2x plus 7y given the below constraints. So first thing we do is we get to using, um, we change them into the form so we can easily graph them and have a better understanding of what's going on. So just like we had before, uh, this is the same example that we were working with when we were talking about the idea of linear programming, maximizing and minimizing objective functions. So this is the same one that we had before. So y is less than or equal to negative 1 third x plus 8 thirds. Uh, 2x plus y becomes y is less than or equal to negative 2x minus 4. And then we've got uh, y is greater than or equal to negative 1 half x. Oh, sorry, not negative 1 half. It gets canceled out as it adds over. So positive 1 half x minus 3 halves. Great. So let's just give a rough sketch so we can see what's going on. We don't have to worry about having this perfectly precise. The idea is just to be able to see this because unlike graphing the solutions to an inequality where we never really figure out the thing so we want to have a solid graph, in this case the graph is just a reference so we can have a better understanding of how the solving is working. So negative uh, one-third x plus eight-third, it'll start up at around you know some height of you know three-ish and so, well, let's, let's actually put in marks. So we've got some rough sense of where we're going here. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Great. OK, so the red one, positive 8 thirds, so almost at the 3, and then negative 1 thirds, it'll slowly slope down to, by the time it gets here, it'll be about here. It'll be dropped down, so. And it is going to be a solid line because it's less than or equal to, so like that. And then y is less than or equal to negative 2x minus 4, so at negative 4. And then for every 1 it goes over, it goes, when it goes to the left, it will go up to, 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 also solid once again because it was a less than or equal. And then final one, also going to be solved, less than or equal to 1 half x minus 3 halves, so halfway between the 1 and the 2, the negative 1 and the 2, at 1 half x, so there. Okay, so it's not a perfect graph, but it gives us a rough idea of what we're looking for. So we're looking for something that's going to be in this part, including the lines. Now, the theory of linear programming, what, we've, what we learned about that critical idea was we know that the answer is going to be, if there is an answer at all, it has to be on one of these vertices. For the maximum and the minimum, each the maximum and the minimum will show up as a vertex on this triangle, or whatever kind of picture we have, it's going to show up as a vertex on this image, one of the corners to our set of allowable points, feasible solutions. So let's figure out what it is. So let's do the red and the blue together first. So if that's the case, we can treat this as y equals negative 1 thirds x plus 8 thirds and y equals negative 2x minus 4 because for this we're trying to figure out where the lines intersect because we're looking for vertices. So negative 1 third x plus 8 thirds equals negative 2x minus 4. Where does our red line and our blue line intersect. Multiply everything by 3. At this point I'm just going to use blue. So multiply everything by 3 for ease. Negative x plus 8 cancels out those fractions. Negative 6x minus 12. We add 12 to both sides. We get 20 over here. Add x to both sides. We get negative 5x. Divide by x on both sides. Sorry, divide by not x, but divide by negative 5 on both sides. We get negative 4 equals x. We can plug this into one of the two functions. Let's go with y, uh, the negative 2x minus 4, because that'll be easier. Once again, we can use it as an equality, because we're looking for line intersection. We aren't worried about the inequality effect. We're worried about as if it were a line, because we only care about the vertex right now. So we can plug that in, and we'll have that y equals negative 2, plug in our x, negative 4, minus 4. y equals negative 2 times negative 4 gets us positive 8, minus 4. So y equals 4. Great. So one of our vertices is negative 4, comma, 4. Great. Next up, what if we had our red intersect our green? So negative 1 third x plus 8 thirds, as if that was the line, would be equal to, because we're looking for the intersection, equal to 1 half x minus 3 halves. So where do those intersect? Let's multiply everything by 6, just so we can get rid of these fractions. I think that makes it easier to look at. So multiply everything by 6. I'll just choose red for the color I'll use here. So that gets us negative 2x 
plus 8 over 3 cancels out the 3 portion of the 6, which means it's going to be 2 times 8, 16. Now we're multiplying by 6 still, so it's going to get us 3x multiplying by 6 minus 9, because 3 halves times 6 becomes 9. At this point, we can solve this out, add 2x to both sides, add 9 to both sides. So adding 9 to both sides, we get 25 equals add 2 to x to both sides, 5x divided by 5, 5 equals x. We can now plug this into either one of them. To me, then x the y equals 1 half x minus 3 halves looks ever so slightly friendlier, so I'll plug into that one. So y equals 1 half x, this one right here, right, this guy here. So y equals 1 half times 5 minus 3 halves, so 5 halves minus 3 halves, which equals 2 over 2, which equals 1. So at this point, we've got another vertex, 5 equals x and y equals 1. So that's going to occur where the red and green intersect over here. So 5, 1. And then finally, let's look at where the blue and the green would intersect, the one that we haven't looked at yet. Negative 2x minus 4 equals 1 half x minus 3 halves. Multiply everything. Oh, sorry. Let's change that into colors just so we can keep our color scheme going. 1 half x x minus 3 halves. We'll multiply everything by 2 to get rid of that fraction. So minus 4x minus 8 equals x minus 3. Put our x's together, put our constants together. So add 3 to both sides, we get negative 5. Add, negative, add positive 4x to both sides, we get 5x. Divide by 5 on both sides, we get negative 1 equals x. We can now plug that into either one. This one to me looks friendlier. So y equals negative 2 times negative 1 minus 4. y equals positive 2, as the negatives cancel out, minus 4. y equals negative 2. So at this point, we've got y equals negative 2 and negative 1 equals x. So a point here will be negative 1 comma negative 2. So we found the three vertices to this, now we need to go use that information. They are negative four comma four, five comma one, negative one comma negative two. So now we want to evaluate them in our objective function, z equals two x plus seven y, and figure out which one makes z biggest, which one makes z smallest, and which one is just somewhere in the middle. All right, so where are our maximum and minimum? Vertices are negative four four, five comma one, negative one comma two. So we've got negative four comma four here, five comma one here, and negative one comma two, negative two here. All right, so let's start off with negative four comma four, negative four comma four. We plug that in for z equals two x plus seven y, so what will our z wind up coming out to be? Two times our x component is negative four, plus seven times our y component is positive four, so that gets us negative eight, plus seven times four, 28, which equals 20. So we get 20 out of negative four comma four. Let's try our next one, five comma one. Plug that in, we get z equals two times our x component of five, plus seven times our y component of one, which equals 10 plus seven, so we get 17. And then finally, we get, uh, we plug in our negative one comma negative two, and that gets us z equals two times x component negative one plus y component seven times negative two. So we get negative two minus 14, which is equal to negative 16. All right, so at this point we can see who is our winner for maximum. That's going to be z equals 20, which occurred at negative four comma four. So negative four comma four is the maximum for our objective function. And negative one comma negative two spat out negative 16. So that was the minimum value that we wound up seeing. And five comma one gave us positive 17, but that's neither a maximum nor a minimum, so we just forget about it. All right, final example. A car lot needs to choose what cars to order for selling on their lot. They've got two options, the Nice, which they purchase at 20,000 and sell at 30,000, and the Superfine, which they purchase at 50,000 and sell at 65,000. If they have a total budget of $2.9 million for purchasing cars and 100 spots on the lot for new cars, how many of each car should they buy to maximize profit? 
assume that they manage to sell whatever they purchase. So the idea here is they purchase a car and then they mark it up and they sell it. And so the difference between the, those two is how much money they make. But they've got limits on how much money they start with for purchasing cars and how many spots they have to actually put the cars on the lot. So they have to figure out what is the best combination of cars to purchase to be able to maximize how much money they make out of it. So with all this in mind, let's start setting some things up. So first, we're going to have to figure out how many numbers of nice they buy. So let's say n is going to be the symbol that we use for saying the number of nice cars that they buy, right? The nice cars that they buy will be n, however many that is. And then the superfines that they buy, s will symbolize the number of superfines that they buy. Okay. Now, another thing that we've got here is we've got a lot of really big numbers, right? 30,000, 20,000, 50,000, 65,000, 2.9 million dollars. Now, we could work with the numbers as they actually are, and everything would wind up working out, but we'd have this extra factor of 1,000 showing up, right? All of these things are divisible by 1,000. So I'm going to say, why don't we make things a little bit easier on ourselves? And since we're dealing with lots of money, right? We're dealing with all these big things measured in the thousands, tens of thousands. Let's convert everything. So for ease, let's work in terms of thousands of dollars. So let's talk about everything in terms of how many K it is, how many thousand, right? K, kilo, thousand. So how many thousand dollars everything is. Okay, so that'll make things a little bit easier just in how many zeros we have to write down. So next, let's figure out how much profit do they make off of a single nice, right? Because what we want to do is we want to maximize the profit. So we need to create some function p that is going to be p equals the profit. So we need to come up with some equation that describes p in terms of how many nice and how many superfines they buy, how much n and s we have to go around, because we know for sure they'll sell all of them. So how much profit do they make if they buy such a number of you know, nice and such a number of superfines. So first we have to figure out how much profit do they make off of selling a nice, how much profit do they make off of selling a superfine. So a nice, if they sell, if they buy a nice, it costs them 20k, right? It costs them 20 k, 20,000. Costs them 20,000, 20, which is 20k in our new form. They can sell that for 30k, which would net them a profit of the amount that they sold it for minus the amount that they had to buy it for. So that would net them a profit of 10k. For the superfines, they cost them 50k to buy. They sell them at 65k, so each one they sell is going to net them a profit of 15k. Okay, so with this in mind, let's write P in green for good old American greenbacks since we're dealing with US dollars here. So P equals 10 times N, the number of nices that we sell, plus 15 times S, the number of superfines that we sell. Because remember, for each nice we sell, we manage to make 10K. For each superfine we sell, we manage to make 15K. So the total profit is going to be 10N plus 15S K, but we don't have to worry about the Ks now. We won't, we won't worry about it when we're actually dealing with the numbers, the fact that they have the unit of dollars, thousands of dollars. All right, but there are some restrictions here. We were told that there's a restriction of 2.9 million dollars for purchasing cars. So they don't just have unlimited amounts of money to buy on cars, right? If they had unlimited amounts of money, they'd want to stock their entire car lot with nothing but superfines. So they'd want to just fill the thing all up with superfines, but they have a cost of these things. So we have to deal with that. So if it's 2.9 million for purchasing cars, then 2.9 million for purchasing cars, well, each nice that we buy is going to be 20 n. And each superfine that we buy is going to cause us to spend 50 s. So 20 n plus 50 s is how much we've spent on cars. Now they can spend up to 2.9 million, right? So 20 n plus 50 s has to be less than or equal to their total budget. And their total budget is 2.9 million, which we can write out as 2,900, because 2.9 million is the same thing as 2,900,000. So since we divided everything by 1,000, we're now dealing with 2,900. All right, 
Another piece of information that we had was that there are only a hundred spots on the lot. So there is a maximum number of spots that they can fit uh, cars into. So if that's the case, if they only have a hundred spots to fit cars into, well then the number of nices that we're buying plus the number of superfines that we're buying has to be less than or equal to 100 because they can only fit up to 100 of these cars on the lot. So that's two requirements so far. Now there's two hidden requirements that we might not see but it'll make it easier to actually graph the thing. Think about this. Is it possible to have a negative number of nices? Can they buy negative cars? No. The lowest number of nices that they can buy, the lowest number of any car that they can buy is zero. So we know that however many nices that they buy, it has to be greater than or equal to zero. And similarly, S must be greater than or equal to zero. So we've got four requirements on this. The amount of money they have to spend, 20N plus 50S has to be less than or equal to 2,900. N plus S has to be less than or equal to 100, right? The number of spots on the lot and the fact that they can't buy negative cars. N has to be greater than or equal to zero. S has to be greater than or equal to zero. And our objective function that we're trying to maximize, because we want to maximize our profit, and our profit is this P equals 10N plus 15S. So we want to maximize P. All right, so at this point, we bring to bear the power of linear programming. So first, let's convert some of this stuff into things that we can easily graph. So let's make, we have to, if we're going to graph this, so we can see what's going on. We've got to choose some guy to be horizontal and some guy to be vertical. So just arbitrarily, let's make N the horizontal, S the vertical. So N gets to be horizontal. S is vertical. So with this idea in mind, we can now talk about ordered pairs that come in the form N comma S, just as X comma Y, horizontal comma vertical. Since we made N horizontal, we made S vertical, it's going to come in N comma S. Now there's no reason it couldn't be flipped, but we just chose one and we stick to it. And as long as we stick to it, it'll work out. Okay, so at this point, if that's the case, then we, since S is the vertical, we normally solve for Y, the vertical, in terms of other stuff. So we want to solve for S, the vertical, in terms of other stuff, because that's what we're used to. So N plus S is less than or equal to 100 means that S has to be less than or equal to negative N plus 100. 20N plus 50S is less than or equal to 2,900. 50S is less than or equal to negative 20n plus 2900. We divide both sides by 50. We've got s is less than or equal to negative 2 fifths n plus 2900 divided by 50 becomes uh, 50. Sorry, give me just a second. Yeah, it becomes 58. I had to use a calculator for that one. So 2,900 divided by 50 becomes 58. So we've got s is less than or equal to negative 2 fifths n plus 58. So with this in mind, we've got enough to be able to see what we're allowed to go for here. So if n has to be greater than or equal to zero, then we've got this graphed, sorry, if n has to be greater than or equal to zero, this is actually going to be the green one. So for a second, forget about that mistake. So n has to be greater than or equal to zero. So we set n equal to zero. We draw a line. S is allowed to go wherever it wants. So everything on this side, is fine and dandy by our n greater than zero. S has to be greater than or equal to zero. We set a line S equal to zero. Everything greater than that, fine and dandy by S greater than or equal to zero. Now, the interesting parts are actually going to wind up being the S less than or equal to negative n plus 100. So if that's the case, we can just sort of get a good sense of this. So let's say 100 is up here. At negative 1, it marches down like this. Right, 45 degree angle. And we know that S has to be less than or equal to negative N plus 100, so it will be below this. And S is less than or equal to negative 2 fifths N plus 58, so it's going to start at a Y intercept height of 58, but it goes much less steeply down at negative 2 fifths. So it goes like that. And it also will allow for the part below it. So the total set of things that's allowed is this highlighted part in yellow. However, the only things that are really going to be interesting are going to be our vertices. The vertex here, 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 and here. I'll circle those 
in yellow just to make them a little bit more obvious, but it's probably becoming pretty hard to see through the loudness of those colors. But we've got an idea of those corners. Now, notice 0, 0 is one of the points. We've got an origin corner. Is it possible to make any money if we plug that into P equals 0, you know, as 0 for N and 0 for S if we buy no cars to sell? No, we can't make any money. So we only have three things to care about, where red intersects green, where red intersects blue, and where blue intersects purple. So if that's the case, let's look at red intersect green first. So that is negative 2 fifths n plus 58 gives us n greater than or equal to 0. So if that's the case, if it's n greater than or equal to 0, so that's a little bit difficult because we're set up for solving for s, right? So where is that going to intersect? Well, at n greater than or equal to 0, we want to figure out at n greater than or equal to 0, we want to figure out what that comes out to be. So if s is equal to negative 2 fifths times 0 plus 58, right? If we know this is going to be equal to s and n greater than or equal to 0, we can treat as n equals 0 because we're only dealing with lines here. So we plug that in here. So we've got negative 2 fifths times 0 plus 58 equals s. So 58s and n of 0. So the point that we get out of this is going to be n0, 58s. So 0, 58 is one of our points so far. Next up, let's look at where the blue intersects the purple. So negative n plus 100 equals the purple had a height of s0, right? No height at all. So that's just going to be 0. So 100 equals n. So that means we've got 100, 100. 0, because if we were to plug that into n plus s, right, n plus s equals 100, since we're dealing with the lines now, if we plugged in that, we'd have 100 plus s equals 100, so therefore s equals 0. So we've got 100 comma 0. So notice that this, these are the two extremes possible for the car lot to sell. It could sell all super fines, right? It could sell nothing but super fines, and it has a maximum amount of money that it can spend, right? 2.9 million. So it can't buy its lot entirely full of super fines. It could only have 58 super fines on the lot before it would run out of money to purchase cars with. On the other hand, it could buy a hundred of the Nices and it would still have money left over, but it's run out of spots on the lot. So it could buy 100 Nices and no super fines and have um, extra money left over, or it could buy, the lot could buy um, all super fines and run out of money before it runs out of spots. So it would have 58 super fines, but still that gives us another 42 spots left for Nices. So those are the two extremes possible so far. Finally, we could also have the possibility of if we have the blue and the red intersect. So if we had negative n plus 100 equal to negative 2 fifths plus 58. No, sorry, negative 2 fifths n plus 58. So we can multiply everything by 5 just to make it a little bit easier on us. Negative 5n plus 500 equals negative 2n plus 58. We turn to a calculator, figure out what 58 times 5 is. We get uh, 290. So 290 out of that. We add 5n to both sides. We subtract by 290 on both sides. 500 minus 290 gets us 210. We add 5n to both sides, that gets us 3n, so that gets us dividing by 3, sorry, not 80, but 70 equals n. We use that to figure out how many superfines that would bring us. So by our lot equation of s is less than or equal to negative n plus 100, we want to be on the line equals, so s equals negative n plus 100, so s equals negative 70 plus 100, or s equals 30. So the three possibilities are 0, 58, 100, 0, and 70, 30. So at this point, we just want to actually plug each one of them in and figure out which of these works best. So let's start with our the point that we've arbitrarily made the red point. So if we sell nothing but super fines, we spend all of our money on super fines, then that's 10 times 0 plus 58, sorry, 10 times 0 plus 15 times 58, just so we keep up the same pattern. 15 
times 58 becomes 870. So we would make a total of $870,000 at the lot if we bought nothing but superfines. Next, we'll do the one that we arbitrarily made the blue point. So the profit out of that one would be 10 times 100 plus 15 times zero, the number of superfines. So the profit that we'd make off the lot would be 1,000 plus zero. So if we sold nothing but naices, we would be able to get 1,000,000 or 1 million off of our sales. But what if we sold a combination of nice and superfine? So if we sold a combination, the one we arbitrarily made the green point, then our profit would be 10 times 70 plus 15 times 30, right? 10 is the profit from the nices, 15 is the profit from the superfines. We're selling 70 nices, 30 superfines. We know that's possible because it's on our vertex. So that gets us 700 plus 15 times 30 is 300 plus 150, 450. So a total profit of 1,150,000, 1, so 70 and 30. So the best, the optimum solution for maximum profit is sell 70 nices and 30 superfines. And if you're curious, that came out to be a profit of 1,150,000, 1, so the total profit, the maximum possible profit for the lot will wind up being $1,150 million. All right, cool. All right, so that finishes up for linear inequalities. Uh, there's this idea of linear programming, and there's also just being able to figure out what are the things that our linear inequality allows for. Linear program is a great thing that we can use all of our information about linear inequalities for, but you can also just work with linear inequalities. All right, we'll see you at educator.com later. Bye.